Hey, hey! Welcome everybody to another episode of Veterinary Careers with Dr. Crocker Pet Vet. This one's headed to bed. Good night. Hey. Love you. All right, so I'm really excited about this one because my friend, Dr. Ashley Bourgeois, is joining me. And she is a veterinary dermatologist and she is one of my fellow DVM mom friends and we connected on Instagram, which is another reason why I love Instagram because you can really connect with people and form true friendships, I believe. Uh, so I was excited when I started doing the series, reached out to her first thing, had to get her on here to talk all about her path to veterinary dermatologist and being a specialist. So we've had some really great guests. We've had a radiologist, we've had a zoo vet, uh, we've had a pathologist, and I have some awesome ones lined up too. I'm really, really excited. So make sure that you drop your questions for me and Dr. Ashley, uh, the derm vet, in the comments. And as soon as we get her on here, we will get started talking about everything. We usually have these last about an hour, um, and that's about the time it takes to cover when most of our specialists kind of realized they wanted to be specialists, what they did prior to vet school, what they did in vet school, uh, and what they have done since then with their careers. So I am excited about it. I think it's going to be a fun talk. i been looking forward to it all day. So I think it's going to be really good. Let me see. I was excited also that my Internet was working, so we could actually have this because Texas has had crazy weather. <gasps> Hi. Hi. Look, we're twinning. Oh, my gosh. I love it. Cute. I uh, I was actually thinking about this. I saw Lowe's last week, and she was all, like, cute and, like, had lipstick on. I was like, well, that won't be me. Um, <laughs> I, I just ran off um, and left my husband with the kids. And I was like, this, what you see is what you get. So, um, so I, I love getting ready and looking nice, you know, but it doesn't happen often. I, I, I think for this, that you are uh, definitely dressed appropriately. So you are good to go. I know Lo looked beautiful uh, last beautiful. week. And I felt like a hot mess next to her. So um, I... <laughs> I appreciate you not uh, not showing me up. So I'm so excited. <laughs> I've been excited all day about this. I was like, this is going to be good. It's going to be fun. Yeah. So I had a lot of questions come in, and you have probably watched some of these or kind of know we, we start even pre-vet school. We start, like, prior to, um, you know, kind of – telling a little bit about getting into vet school and when did you start to kind of think about dermatology if it was in the pre-vet era. Um, so, oh, Dr. Duan, Jackie's on here. I cannot say her last name to save my life. Duanis. Duanis. I don't know. Everyone struggles with my name too. So I, you know, it's okay. Yeah. She's another uh, vet mom. So, oh, and we are definitely going to talk about some of the exciting things that you have going on um, with kind of, derm nerd stuff and then also fun shirts you're developing uh, if you want to talk about it it's up to you yeah so. okay yeah, totally we can absolutely talk about it. i'm really excited i just don't know when it's gonna happen but it should be soon um so to answer your first question about um kind of getting up to it so what's kind of ironic is i actually didn't have a lot of pets growing up i grew up my dad was a pilot in the air force so we moved around a ton um, and so we didn't really have, we had a cat when I was super young and at one point we had a dog for a little bit, but then we ended up moving and, um, having to find it another home based just on the situation. So I actually didn't have a lot of pets, but I always gravitated towards animals. And I remember it was like fifth grade. I think we had like a vet career, um, or a career day and a yeah. vet came in and I just hadn't even thought about it because we didn't really have animals to bring in. I think like in fourth grade, I remember there was a time I wanted to be an astronaut because I thought space was really cool. Yeah. And there was a time I wanted to be an archaeologist because I thought dinosaurs were really cool. Um, and then once fifth grade hit and we had that career day and I realized I could make my job be that, um, pretty much was full steam ahead at that point. So I was kind of one of the younger ones that um, knew I wanted to at least work with animals somehow. But you probably um, didn't even know there was veterinary dermatologist in No, I don't, 
I no, think- my parents didn't even know there was veterinary dermatologist <laughs> until, until I told them I wanted to become one. You're, they're um, like, that's a thing? What? Totally. Oh, yeah. My grandparents, my parents are like, what do you mean you're going to go to more school? Cool. Uh, no, I, d- Durham didn't. Um, I went in, so I went, uh, so we moved around a lot. We ended up going, I went to high school in uh, Minnesota, which is where my parents are originally from. And um, then I went to undergrad at Iowa State, and they had actually moved back to Missouri when I went to college. And so I ended up going to the University of Missouri for vet school, did my, and it was my first year there. So I always joke that's an anesthesiologist that made me fall initially, like put the derm bug in. He made some, um, it was like one of our orientations and he made some comment about, oh, if I could go do it all over again, I'd be a dermatologist because there wouldn't be emergencies and you can work nine to five. Um, and like, you know, ding. <laughs> yeah, not the anesthesiology life. And yeah, it, there's a part of me. It's like, that would be nice, but yeah. it wasn't really obviously what made me fall in love with it. Um, cause I don't, I mean, I choose to work more hours now than ever before. Hi. I think there's a there's a really good chance I can have a toddler burst in, so no worries. <laughs> I should have locked the door. Like what what was I thinking? <laughs> so we actually do do that when I lecture and do webinars. We um we have a child lock on the opposite side of that door Uh-oh. for our dog our dog and our kids because yeah, yeah. our dog doors. Can you got uh-huh. it? Yeah, you froze just for a second, but I think it was okay. We're okay. We're good. Okay. So um, you, you so we they lock me in when I lecture. Like we literally child lock it, or else the kids and the dog will try to get in. So I totally feel you. Um, and this but yeah, so, so that was the original. Like, oh, cool. Yeah, that would be cool. Great. But it was truly like the end of my first year. Um, that I, we had, you know, some just introductory things into it and what made me fall in love with it. Um, well, I learned, so I went into vet school thinking I would do small animal, maybe a little bit of equine. I actually spent the summer before I went to vet school, um, at a equine like hospital. See, I'm already having a toddler trying to bust in, um, in Florida. So to get more equine experience. And, um, so I went in thinking I would do that. And then at the end of my first year, I realized um, that maybe I would do, I think general practitioners are amazing how much you guys balance and know whenever uh, someone comes in and they're like, well, why didn't my vet pick up on this? I'm like, you got to realize this is all I do. Like, I don't even know the vaccine protocols anymore. Like my dog goes to a general practitioner because I have no idea how to do any of that stuff. So I learned that I would, I would probably do better um, being really good at one thing. one thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so for Durham, why I loved it was it's visual. I'm a very visual person. Um, I like that I can touch and look at directly the organ that I'm dealing with. Um, and I am very relational. So I love people. Um, I love connection and being in a specialty where I actually got to you know, truly, like I see a pet when they're two for bad allergies, I will be them with them the rest of their lives. So um, I loved that aspect of it. So then that's kind of where I started going full steam ahead was probably the end of my first year. Okay, so let's back up a little bit. Yeah. And talk to me about undergrad, when you're thinking about going to vet school, were you like a gunner? Were you getting all the recommendations? Did you get into vet school your first time? What were you doing pre-vet school? Yeah, I was definitely a gunner. Um, that is my personality. That does not say. surprise you. Yeah, <laughs> <I'm fine. laughs> um, yeah. I am um, definitely an overachiever. Um, like I want to kind of, I set my side on something that's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can be good and bad, as you know, with some of the conversations we've had. Um, but I'm very fortunate. I have a husband who kind of pulls me back sometimes and slows me down. Right. Um, but kind of I, when I was listening to the conversation with Lo, I was c- kind of similar in, in one aspect. So I went to Iowa State. I got all my prereqs done. I applied my junior year. 
thinking, oh, hopefully I would get an interview and I could practice um, and then really try, you know, when I graduate the next year. Yeah. And I ended up getting in, which I felt very thankful for, but it was really surprising to me. And I think lo there's lots of things like I had, I was super extracurricular. I spent a lot of time shadowing. Um, I... Uh, you know, had good grades, but why it was kind of ironic was I was actually not doing as well as I, as an overachiever would hope for in organic right. chemistry. I had dropped the class. The only class I ever, ever thought about dropping. I dropped the class like a week before I went to interview. Cause I thought there's a right it was after I interviewed, but like before I found out and I thought, you know, You're not, I'll just yeah. try again. And I got in and was like, oh my God, I need that credit. So I had to go back to my professor and say, um, will you please let me in? I literally just have to pass the class because I'm in school. He's like, you just have to pass. And I was like, I just have to pass. Um, so it was like super vivid to me because I'd never studied harder for a final. And I think I ended up, it was like one of the only, like I said, I'm an overachiever. It's like one of the only C's I ever got. And I was like, so incredibly thankful because yeah. I was like, okay, I'm in. So it was like really weird to be honest. Um, I think there's pros and cons to that. Like getting in early, early. Yeah. it's great. Right. But you do miss out on some like experiences and I, I'm a, I'm an old soul. So I'm like a fairly mature person, but there was other people who got in early where I think it was really hard for them. Yeah. Like some people got in, I don't know, I, and they were really young, like not even, you know, 21 and we would all go out and that I was, was gonna say, like... <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, it's great. And to, and honestly, what ended up happening was I, um, I actually did end up going back online to finish my bachelor's degree because again, super nerdy overachiever. Like, I and, but I, yeah. I was like, well, it was like a pride thing. Like I spent a lot of time and money there and I want to prove like I got it. But I got it after my DVM. So in the first That's year of my crazy. residency, yeah, I like took a couple online classes. I think like one was equine nutrition. I was like, I mean, I just have to pass that one. Right. Um, right. And they let me use like some of my residency stuff as like, you know, work study. But yeah, so I actually got my bachelor's after my DVM just because I wanted to prove that I finished it. Well, I think so. it's interesting though, because I didn't even know... I always thought you had to finish school or like, you know, be a senior at, to apply. And then, I mean, we had people who applied their sophomore year because they had all their credits and all their, so really you don't have to wait till the end of college to apply. As soon as you have all your prereqs and you have enough of those covered, you can actually apply to vet school um, and you yeah. never have to get your undergrad degree, which to me seems so weird but there's a ton of people who do it and it saves you a lot of money financially which is not a bad thing um but i do think the maturity factor is is big too for getting through school and uh handling the stress and the pressure you know well so oh yeah i think it's, it, everyone's different but i totally agree like even though it sounds funny for me to say because i ended up doing it but i was like shocked but for everything you said like I could l go move closer to my parents because they had moved since they started going to school. My dad ended up being deployed um, for a year when I was there. So it was nice because I was only an hour and a half from my mom. Um, yeah. um, so it ended up working out. But yeah, in hindsight, I think there is a lot to be said about enjoying undergrad and, you know, not necessarily rushing the process. Dr. Marshall said his wife had accepted the vet school when she was 18. And I that's can't even crazy. imagine. That's crazy. Like I... At 18, I was just trying to figure out how to make it to class at 8 o'clock in the morning. Like, that was the extent of it. So, <laughs> that's crazy. Okay, so you get into vet school first time, Gunner. You're going through vet school. You start thinking about DERM. So, once you kind of knew, like, this is going to be the path, is the next thing you're going to be looking for is a rotating internship? Or what are you looking for next? And what did you do to accomplish that next step while you were in vet school? Yeah. So at Missouri, what I really liked about their program is we actually did, um, like 
two, a little over two years of class. And then you got almost two years of clinics. So our summers were shortened. Our summers were only like, I think five or six weeks long to make up that class time. But then we got more clinical time. So you had more availability to do rotations. At Missouri, we actually didn't have a full-time dermatologist. We had a part-time dermatologist who'd come like two days every other week. Um, so I essentially went and formed my own derm rotations. Which of course you did. Yeah, <laughs> which in some aspects was great, right? Because it, um, Durham, I think there's like 300 of us. So we're a, like a smaller college. So I still can, I still know all the people I spent time with. Um, and it was great as far as networking and I loved it and I got to travel and see other places, but it, it did, you had to be proactive and do it yourself. Um, and then my internship. So I did do an internship. Derm, you don't have to. You see tons of dermatology and general practice, honestly. Um, I just really wanted to. Like, I think it solidified to me that this is exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I also just liked the camaraderie of having an experience at another place. So I did my rotating internship at Purdue. They had a dermatologist. She's since retired, um, but she was only there like part time too. So I actually ended up spending a lot of time with a dermatologist in Indianapolis, which was really like an hour, hour and a half away from Purdue. And she actually at the time was with the company I ended up doing my residency with. So it was kind of weird that it worked out exactly the way it should. When I applied my, um, intern year in the match for residency, I did not match. So I think that's something really important for people to know. I think there's like four programs that year, like two of them took their, kept their interns, but I spent my own money and time going and interviewing at the four places that had a spot that year. And what ended up happening, I still remember like breaking down in the intern room in tears because I, you know, you open it up, it's like 8 a.m. and I didn't match, even though I was worried that was a possibility because there wasn't many programs. But what ended up happening was my program that I ended up in um, was outside the match. And in obviously in retrospect, it ended up being exactly the program that I would have wanted. And what happened was, I went and inter I, I went to the Durham meetings in April. So I went there and I networked like crazy. Um, and I found out that this spot had opened up and I talked to them and they interviewed, uh, they picked three of us to interview, flew us out there. Uh, it's a animal dermatology clinic in Orange County, California. And we have several clinics throughout the country. I went, I worked two, when I did my internship, they've changed it because this is crazy. We did, we would do two straight weeks of overnight emergency, not a single day off. Um, which in some ways was great because when you did it, you didn't have to ever cover for anybody, but by right. night 10, you were a zombie. I went through 14 straight nights of overnights, flew the next day to California, um, and interviewed for a couple days. And I think I interviewed fine, but honestly, they said what ended up happening was everyone at Purdue, like every mentor I had there, every, you know, internist all berated them and called them. And they said they couldn't like go a day without being like, we want to talk to you about Ashley. Why do you have to take her? And that just goes to show how important networking and having a support system through all the steps of your education really is. Yeah. Cause you've people who put the, their name on the line for you and say, you have to take this person. I mean, I honestly think that's why I ended up getting my residency. Well, especially in such a small specialty where, mm -hmm. you know, everyone kind of knows everybody. So real quick for your small animal rotating internship right after school, did you, you went into an academic one and we've talked to a lot of the specialists about private practice versus academic uh, internship. So do you feel like for DERM, you have a better chance of matching if you go the academic route versus the private practice route, or do you think it matters? I think it really depends on the year. And that's the hard thing. Like there's more programs I know offered this year. I think there's more programs that are starting to be offered compared to like when I did this, because this was now like 11 years ago, which is crazy. It makes me sound super old. Yeah, um, yeah. But so I think, I mean, some years there's more private practice, some years there's more academic. And I think it really depends on what you want. 
I think it actually worked out exactly the way it was supposed to be that I ended up in a private practice residency um, because the benefit is the caseload. Like we definitely see a much heavier caseload. Um, you know, we do presentations for each other to learn our scientific topics, but we didn't have to, you know, we had students that extern, but we didn't necessarily have to do like student rounds. So we kind of got to focus more on our education. I think it just depends on what you want. If you want to do more research, and potentially teach students, um, academics by far are gonna be a better option for you. But one really good thing about dermatology is you see so much of it anywhere you go. And besides video otoscopy and then potentially laser as far as more advanced things, and it's always great to have like CT, you can do so much of it just with slides in a microscope and biopsy. Um, so I think our specialty tends to be a little bit more forgiving as far as that goes. Do you think that you are more competitive going the academic route or it just still depends like on the year and how many spots there are and all of that? Because a lot of a lot of them seem to feel like the academic route was more competitive in general. Um, and maybe it's because they're all part of the match, basically. Um, but it seemed like it was maybe harder to get into or more grade based because there were so many applicants um, versus private practice, which was maybe more relational um, because it's, you know, it's more like who you know, who you've met, who's visited you, where not everyone can visit every school. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I think there's probably some truth to that. Um, you know, we're actually taking a resident this year, like outside the match, because we're getting the official like approval for ours. And as a person who's starting to interview people, one because the match is going to release, we'll wait till that's done, and then we'll interview people who didn't match. Like me personally, looking at someone, but I'm in a private practice. I care more about personally, like referral, like their reference letters, um, and I care more about their interview. Because to me, like, yes, grades are great. Like, we want to see that someone's, like, competent. But, like, I don't really care if it's someone who has a 4.0 versus a whatever, like, 3.2. If I have to put, I want to know that they're dedicated. I want to know they're going to talk to clients really well. Right. Because dermatology is so much communication. And I don't really care if someone got straight A's if they can't talk to somebody. And, you know, when I'm off, and, off on a day in the clinic and they have to talk to my clients... I want to make sure it's someone that my clients feel really confident with. So personally for me, and maybe it's because I am private practice, I would be much more like, I would pay much more attention to who's writing their letters and what do they say about them? How did they interview? Is it someone I want to be around? We're super like our culture at our clinic is really good. And we're super protective of that. Super protective of that. Um, and like how did they go out and do a lot of derm things? And this is something they have really, really tried to know that they want to do. I, I think the really great practices with great cultures, in my opinion, are, are very protective of that. And it, I agree that to me, if someone said, I know this person, this person is amazing. They're a teamwork, you know, type individual. Um, they are hungry to learn. They're like brave and jump in there. That is going to mean way more to me. I will, I will probably never look at grades when I'm hiring because I just don't think that's an indicator of competency or success in our profession. So um, that's, interesting and I do so you know your specialty is very face-to-face -face. if you think about it like a lot of specialties if you're a surgeon like you cut and you don't actually interact with clients as much you know you get the referral and you do it um obviously like I did ClinPath Kate and she's a pathologist and she never interacts you know with uh clients and so do you feel like you were drawn to derm because it is more relational and client-based in general or did you love the microscope and love derm or was it just a combination of everything i think it was definitely a combination of everything but a huge part of it totally is relation like uh, uh, absolutely like that is what i thrive off of like i thrive off of people like i like am dying inside right now not having things like in-person conferences and hugging people um i've had clients now that you know since being curbside what almost a year um I've gone through a whole journey with them and I've never met them face to face. And it's very bizarre to me. 
Um, so I think that was a huge part of it. And that's, and that's what I yearn for. I'm I, like, I'm the opposite. I would not want to see someone just twice, like, you know, cut, recheck done, but that's why I think that med's so awesome. There are so many different paths that you don't have to be stuck in one just because either you're not a people person or you're not, not a people person. And right. like there's so many different ways to go with Durham. I truly think you have to be you know, a people person, um, cause you have to be willing to teach them. You have to be willing to deal with frustration. Um, you have to be willing to tell them it's 95% of what we deal with is not curable, but we can manage it. And I have my own allergic dog right now and it is super frustrating and yeah. I do for a living. So you have to be able to meet people where they're at. And what I also love about Derm is I always view it as a puzzle. Um, I see 10 allergic dogs, I have 10 different plans because it depends on what the owner financially can do, what they can emotionally do. Um, you know, it depends on that pet and what they'll tolerate. Um, there's so many different ways that we have to meet people where they're at. And I think that's why I'm a really good clinical dermatologist. Um, because I am empathetic. Like I understand, you know, obviously we hope people are kind about it, but you know, I understand people say, well, I just can't afford that or, you know, I have a toddler and I just can't be do a strict diet trial. I hear you. I barely did a strict diet trial with my own toddler. So it's like, you just have to be willing to flex with that. And that's probably why I'm better at private practice rather than, you know, maybe more academic because I'm, I feel kind of like more like a cowgirl. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, it's okay. We can figure it out. We'll figure it out. Yeah. I think, I think our personalities are similar in that. Like I kind of like the challenge of having to make it work and it not being like black and white. Dr. Courtney DVM is on here and he is actually going to be the surgeon that I uh, interview on here eventually. So I'm excited to hear his story, but he says he does like to interact with clients. So I just, for all surgeons out there, I apologize. Some of you do like to, most of the ones I've met seem to love curbside and do not like to, but um, (laughs) I know that all, and Clint Pathkate said she does not like the general public, so she sticks to (laughs) it. I do, I I do have a couple, like, very specific questions. So, salary-wise, do you have any idea what internships are running right now and residencies for the route you took? So that is super dependent, depending on the state and facility. Um, and I'm not trying to cop out when I say that. Um, I know it's from firsthand experience because our a lot of our clinics are based in California. Right. And California just passed a law where you actually have to pay, like there is a minimum salary that you have to make, like as a certain type of employee. Huh. So our, now granted, when I lived in Orange County, California, I paid like way more in rent than I did when I lived in Lafayette, Indiana. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's probably a good thing, but like, I think the starting, I think for our residency, the starting salary um, will be like mid fifties. I want to say, and it goes up every year based on California law. And then all of our clinics are matching that. Um, so like in Portland, it'll match that, but I know some internships and residencies that depending on where they're at and what laws are, and, you know, depending on cost of living, some of them can be more in like the thirties. So it definitely can be lower for sure. And some, like when I did my internship, we got paid, um, X amount of, uh, money like per overnight er case we took and that it wasn't a ton maybe like 50 bucks a case but it was something and most don't do that so there's a little bit of fluctuation depending on the program in that sense i do think that the financial component of it of you know getting out of school and then only making that amount of money you have to have the long game in sight you have to say like okay this is what i'm going to sacrifice right now and i can but eventually hopefully, and and I do think Durham is one of those specialties that you will make more money in the long run than most of your general practicing vets, um, depending on how much you work. Um, But most of the dermatologists I know seem to have a very comfortable salary uh, once they are down the road. And you are actually an owner in, or a part owner in the business entity that you guys are, right? How did that happen? Yeah. So it's actually really cool. Um, and something that I love about my company and that's where I'm, that's where I say, like, even when I went through that whole not matching program, it was totally like so cliche, like the stars aligned is exactly happened how it should have. 
because I've been super involved with my company ever since I became a part of it, even as a resident. And so essentially the way that our company is, we have, uh, well, it's changed a little bit since I got involved because we consolidated, but essentially we have shareholders. So you can purchase shares within the company and then you're considered like a part owner. Um, I think there's like 10 or 11 of us that are like owners within the company. So you have to get approved to be offered ownership. Um, and then kind of just depending on like the what's available or, you know, how many shares there are, how expensive they are, depending then you purchase them and you can also purchase from people who say are going to retire. Um, so that's been really cool just to feel like I've had ownership in the company. Um, and then last year I got elected to board of directors, which has really been amazing because I just love, again, clinic culture, like, you know, best medicine, like that is something that our company truly believes in. And so it's literally me. I think I'm the only, I'm the only woman and I'm the only woman I'm the only person like under 60. So it's pretty entertaining. It's pretty entertaining sometimes. But what I will say is it just makes me love my company that much more. Um, Cause there's definitely other people who uh, guarantee in the next couple of years will also follow suit. We have strong women in our company. Um, we have strong younger generation in our company, but I love it that they wanted me to be a part of that. Like it just goes to show when you find the right company who has that vision that really wants to listen to the younger generation that wants to listen to, you know, a hot mess mom of two. Yeah. Um, it just makes me that much more excited. And I'm really proud to say that. I, yes, that is awesome. And I knew you were a board member and I love it even more knowing you're like the only woman under 60 on the board. Like that is, that's, amazing and your perspective is one that they need to hear because one we know the more like diverse and inclusive leadership is in a practice then it's going to trickle down and it's going to be a better experience for everyone and especially with covid and having to deal with working parents um like i'm sure that those men don't have to deal with the what am i going to do with my child during covid with daycare shut down like all of those things and so having you on there and having that perspective and being able to speak and empower some of the women in your practice. I mean, that's really, really important. So obviously we need more women doing that, but, um, <laughs> that's, that's good. So tell me a little bit about your day in general. And I know you changed your schedule recently. Um, but when, okay, first, when you were resident, what was your schedule kind of like? And then now that you're a practicing dermatologist, what was it and what is it now? Yeah, it's transformed a lot. So my so my first two years we rotated five four five four, um, so that we would have a day off to just solely focus on you know, uh, like we didn't have like oh you get two weeks off to do research like some academics would. It would be more that was always integrated within your schedule. Like you could always ask for more time if you needed it or needed to go visit a clinic to say, do your research. Um, but we went five, four, five, four, um, and we were pretty much nine to five. And then your last year you worked four day weeks and it was nine to five. Um, I, I, when I moved to Portland five years ago, I was, we were still pretty much like nine to five. We'd have an hour and a half lunch, but then some of the clinics were running into issues with exam room space, having everyone on the exact same schedule. Um, and so me and the other dermatologists I work with here, probably like a year, it was after I had my second child, probably like a year and a half ago, I said, you know, um, I was starting to get burnt out. I loved work, but getting off at stopping seeing appointments at five and having to get my kids by six, like, you know, if I didn't get done right on time, I just felt like it was like run, grab them, go. And then I was starting to do the derm vet, which people probably don't realize how much time that takes. Well, when you're working, you know, one, you might have one day off a week, like I had Fridays off, but then that often was also catch up time for my family as far as groceries or pediatrician appointments, which are super consuming with young kids. Um, so then I asked about shifting my schedule. And so we both shortened our lunches to an hour, um, so that we could have more catch up time at the end of the day. And then I started at seven 30. So I would go seven 30 to three with just an hour lunch. And that worked out really well. I was still four days a week. And then last October, which you were involved with when I was saying, I need to do this, but I'm like hesitant. Yeah. Um, 
I went down to three days a week. So my, it was just too much. My husband was starting to ask like every nap time on Saturday and Sunday, you, you feel like you, you're always saying how hey, you have to go do this stuff. And it, you know, we're locked in, we're all mentally fatigued. And then you're always running off to work. And it, I, it was at a crossroads where it was either if I want to do the derm vet, like I need to, that's work and I need to view it as work. And when I want to work seven days a week with a one and a three-year-old at home, I don't. So um, then I went down to three days a week and I extended my days to 7.30 to four so I could just work a little bit longer of a day um, so we didn't hit our caseload too much. And so far that's been working really well. Um, you know, I finally have gotten over the guilt every time I'd have like the extra day off. I'd be like, oh, but the clinic, I'm super fortunate. My company's really supportive. My, the dermatologist I work with is super supportive and they know all the other stuff I do and how much it takes time. Um, so now that's what I work. Most times I work Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, but Tuesday, Friday are full on derm vet. Like it is kids go to daycare. I'm working on webinars or I'm giving presentations or I'm recording. Um, so even by the time it hits Saturday now, I'm kind of like, Ooh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think so, so many good points there. Yes. Having social media or doing all that, it is a whole nother beast and a whole nother job essentially. Um, and so I, I, I'm jealous of your schedule. Um, I did the same thing years ago with, scheduling in rooms, kind of looking at our schedule and saying, hey, the surgery seat's open at this time, and I would like to just come in and do surgery first thing and then start doing rooms when the rooms are then open, and then I want to leave early, and I'm not going to even take a lunch. I'm going to take a 20-minute lunch, and it was like my boss was just like, what? That it? And he's like, that would work, and it opened up a revenue stream because we took appointments over lunch, and we never had before, and he really loved it and the clients loved it. And I leave and pick my kid up three days a week. And I think creative scheduling, it doesn't even have to be as a specialist. You do it. It's really something that you can offer. Um, and it will work for your clients too. And it will work for your staff and you will be happier and you'll be a better veterinarian if you can kind of find that balance. And I think so many people feel like they have to work certain hours that have always been worked or always been done. And it's just not true. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Now on your days off, I think that the personality we are, it's like, I got to get, I got to do stuff, right? Like I have to get all this done. And I just recently in the last year kind of was feeling like the pressure all the time. And so I've had to like mentally tell myself, like, you're, you're not going to do anything for this whole afternoon. Like you're going to, hang out and you're going to take a nap and you're going to, and it's been really good for me to decompress a little bit. Um, but I had to force myself to do that. So I do think that the pressure we put on ourselves to do everything and be everything is really tough. Do you think being a specialist makes it easier for you to have flexibility or not? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it makes sense. Um, I think it doesn't necessarily matter if you're GP or specialty. I think that all comes down to your clinic and the clinic culture. Because like you said, you were able to make those adjustments. And I ha we had previous leadership where they were not super open to that. Luckily, our recent leadership the last few years has been super supportive of family life balance. Tell me what you need. I, he literally asked me, what's your ideal schedule? And he's like, let's make it work. And the other dermatologist they work with, the thought of her going in early for her is like, no, thank you. Yeah. And to me, I, and I hate, I actually hated going to work at nine. I felt like it was too late. Like, that sounds really weird, but I get up early anyway. And so I would rather like get going and be able to catch up with stuff at the end of the day. But that's not for everybody. But it's like what works really well for us. So I think that really comes down more to your individual clinic than having to worry whether you're a specialist or not. And I think that's a good um, question. I will kind of tell students when they're talking about interviewing and visiting clinics is, you know, does everyone have the exact same schedule or asking like, oh, have you guys ever considered doing like longer days and less days or, you know, like creative scheduling? Because it's nice to know how open places are to those things as possibilities. Um, the Wrecking Ball wants to know for both of you, how does having a large social media presence affect your practice or interaction with clients? Do they know or realize? Um, I will let you go first on that one. Do you want? To sure. 
Yeah, I don't think most realize. Um, we do have something that clients sign for all clients that you know ask for the permission to do pictures. But when I take my own clinical pictures, I all I always mention it to clients. Um, like, hey, I, I have taken. Uh, I would love to get some great before and afters of your pets. I like to teach other veterinarians through various platforms. Um, and I won't use it if they don't say okay, but almost all do. Um, especially when it's ones that's like showing, you know, it's not just like a paw and you could don't know whose paw that is, but when it's like full face, right. most are really excited because they really do. If it's a case that's, you know, really, you can tell what the dog is. I almost never post it unless it's like a before and after, unless the owner's like really diligent. Yeah. I have had some clients find me through social media, um, which is always kind of fun and interesting, yeah. but I don't necessarily announce it. Like I don't say, Oh, the derm vet go follow me, but they, you know, if I use a picture, I do let them know that I'm educating other veterinarians through using them. And then I always tag my clinic in the, um, uh, clinical pictures too. And that's just like something that I talk to our CEO about just making sure we are all supportive of each other. You know, they just wanted to make sure that they knew where I worked. So if someone did find me, they would know. Yeah. I, I would agree that majority of my clients don't know um, I have a couple, a handful of amazing clients and even um, some Instagram famous uh, patients, uh, you know, in our area. And so it's fun when they come in because they always tag they're coming in and then I take pictures and tag them. And it's just like a fun interaction thing. But I don't think I've had people find me and come to me really from my social media. It's similar where something will happen and I'll say, oh, this is great. Can I video it or can I share it? And people are like, oh, that's great. And you know, I'm like, if you want to see it, you can go see it here. But, you know, it's totally up to you. But I think both of our accounts are, are geared towards the veterinary professionals. We're not really, our audience is not our clients uh, necessarily. I mean, there's some client content in there, but um, it's a little different when you're trying to gain clients through the account uh, for your hospital versus educating veterinary professionals. And you kind of have to pick a path, in my opinion, um, because it's two totally different ways of approaching things. Um, if I was just doing clients, it would be all the cute puppies and kittens and success stories. And it wouldn't ever really be some of the realities we face as much. Um, so that's just me, but do you agree? Yeah, I agree. And I think it also changes how you put the content out. Like I, I've written some articles that are geared towards pet parents and I'm getting involved right now with a um, organization called Top Vets Top Pets. That's a lot of veterinarians trying to really reestablish the relationship um, instead of people going to other sources, trying to drive people back to the vet. Um, but I, I do think that um, I'm very clear that everything I do under the Derm Vet is meant to educate veterinarians. And it changes how you say things, right? Like if I was going to talk, write something for a client, I wouldn't write atopic dermatitis. I'd write environmental allergies. So I do think it, it, it provides better clarity and takes the stress off if you have a clear vision of what your main audience is. Yeah. And your, your account can evolve um, and you can kind of broaden your audience over time or like Dr. Christie, she used to mainly do, you know, student kind of content and veterinary, and now she's, getting more into client education and like pet parents. And I think she's doing a good job of transitioning that, but it is a, it is a tricky thing. Um, I did have someone ask, and I'm going to answer this first because they want to know what the least favorite part of your job is. And the least favorite oh. part of Derm for me is I hate that I can't cure it. I just have to control it. It is like frustrating. Um, but you seem to love the challenge and the communication side of that. And so what is your least favorite part? Well, I would say one caveat to that because I, I totally recognize. So here's my caveat. I see a different clientele. Right. So I don't say that to say I don't have those frustrations. I absolutely do. I've had clients upset. I've had clients come in and only be able to afford my exam fee. So sometimes people think we're just going to see the clients who will do it all. And it's not true at all, right. but I do think we have a higher tendency to have people who've accepted they're going to see a specialist. So, you know, I think there is a bit of a, a you know, I just don't like to make it sound equivalent because I know you guys are going to have different challenges. Um, so there's that. 
I, yeah, that doesn't bother me so much doing this for so long now. Like I kind of accept it. I also, I'm a talker obviously. So like if one thing, my texts are like, you talk to your clients so long. I'm like, yeah, that's my job. Like I, we deal with chronic things that are frustrating. Yeah. Is it fun for me to do the exact same allergy talk like eight times a day? Well, no, but that to them, that is the first time they're hearing it. So they deserve that time. Right. Um, if I just pick the thing that I don't like the most, I probably pick sex hormone, sex hormone alopecia and perianal fistulas. Personally, <laughs> I would yeah, be perianal fistulas oh. are pretty bad. Well, I hate them because it's always like a poor German shepherd who's huge that needs like super expensive cyclosporin, and then sex hormone alopecia I hate because. There's really like, I've had a couple of respond to therapy, but you just like, you know, it's either hopeless or you kind of get them to get some hair back and we don't really understand the disease at all. So I think I'd actually probably choose to see that. I probably see perianal fistulas over sex hormone alopecia. Anytime <laughs> I feel like balding Pomeranian, I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, not at all. Oh, they're cute in their little outfits, I have to say. Well, and that's fine if people are accepting of that, but yeah. people, you know, like, people come in, they're like, you need to figure this out. I'm like, well, we can run a sex hormone panel. We can try this medication. I've had some of them respond, but to be honest, a lot of them don't. So yeah. it's fine if people are accepting of it, and we can do all the epidermal barrier stuff, but sometimes people come in really hopeful we're just going to get all their hair back. And you're like, no, not yeah, happening. Why not? Okay, so we have... A, just a little bit of time left. So I want to make sure that people are very aware of how they can like find you and everything you have going on, which I think is probably too much uh, to even get through. I know we'll both be speaking at Fetch coming up uh, mm -hmm. this next week. Um, so that's exciting. And I'll be on there. Obviously, like we'll both be on there answering questions during our sessions, even though they're pre-recorded. Um, but what else do you have going on? What else is cooking? What do you want to share? Yeah. So I do, I am doing one live at Fetch. So there's oh, one I'm doing next okay. Friday. That is a live one, but yeah, a, it's a mix of live and pre-recorded. The other ones are pre-recorded, but that one's live. Um, so yeah, besides social media accounts, like the podcast is a really big passion project of mine. Um, mostly because it, I do it to make it easy, tangible information. It's a mix of just me talking about something for 10 to 15 minutes and interviewing people, which I love because then I get to learn more. Um, so that's just the Durham Vet podcast because I wanted to keep things easy. Yeah. Um, and then um, I'm, I have a few other conferences coming up. That's I have a website, thedurhamvet.com. Again, I keep things easy um, yeah. where we update all of those. The other thing I'm actively working on, which you kind of alluded to earlier, is the Durham Nerds. So that has been on my dream board forever. And the whole idea was to get a community of people who truly love dermatology. And there is some CE approved stuff in there. Like I have a cytology lecture um, that I did and it's gonna be a paid group where people go in and essentially um, wanna learn. So I put up cases. It's basically like if you took the podcast and social media and like combine them and put it on steroids like that's right. essentially what the derm nerds is going to be so we did a beta group i just had um conversations with everyone in that group this past weekend seeing what they liked what they didn't like and then the hope is that it's gonna um launch mid-march to everybody and so it's on a separate platform that we all find a lot less distracting and i'm really excited to see where it ends up i am excited about it i like I think when you're with and talking to other people that are also interested in something, it's cool to see like what their thought process is. And the cases to me are always helpful, even though I feel like all I ever see is environmental allergies. Occasionally I see something that I'm like, so I, I like that there's other things in there. Um, and then obviously I love your podcast. You've had on some good guests uh, and we've had yeah. some fun together. Um, yeah, you so, and Lo have both been on it. I I'm, I know we've had some fun. It's a, uh, I, I, the podcast to me, I will listen to it because you've made such great short little episodes that you can really just like get good information in a short amount of time when I'm doing something and I just can like work out and listen, you know, so um, you've done a great job with that. The other thing is you are like me, you're a mom and you're a working mom and a, and a veterinarian and it is a lot and we are very open about the fact that we have a lot of support and help and that's how we do all these things. We do not do it alone. Um, but we both kind of 
want to empower other women and just encourage people. So you have a lot of fun ideas about that. So do you want to share any of that or just talk yeah. about your passion? No, totally. So, um, yes. Yeah, so as, uh, I kind of mentioned earlier, I have a one and a three year old. They're both like about to, they're almost two and four. They, they have like, they're getting ready for their second round of COVID birthdays, um, which I feel <laughs> bad about. Um, cause literally like when the world shut down was my son's first birthday, March 19th. So I was like, sorry. Yeah. Um, and I didn't ever anticipate he'd get another one. Um, so it is a lot. We don't live by our family. I do. My brother lives about 40 minutes away. Um, but our extended family doesn't live here. So that provides challenges, especially with COVID. My husband's super duper supportive, but it's still a challenge, you know, me finding that balance because you and I are both the type that could just work and, and love it all the time. Yes. And so you do need someone who kind of takes you down and re makes you refocus on what is important. Um, but one thing I can say as far as being a vet mom, we are all different. And just because you see someone like us who tends to do a lot and you know, juggle it all and still take pictures with their kids and be happy. One, we still have struggles for sure. I had quite the weekend with my three-year-old. Um, and then two, it's not, we like this stuff. Yes. Like sometimes people see it and they're like, oh, but I'm not doing enough. I'm like, if you don't want to do it, you should not do it. Like right. I would never be a stay-at-home mom. I would go crazy. Like when we had the ice last week, which was nothing compared to what you guys had in Texas, but we had our kids back, uh, home straight for like four or five days and we couldn't leave. I was like, please daycare open back up. Yeah. So like, it's okay that we're all different. And I don't like when people see that they put pressure on themselves. Like, but you do the podcast and you do all this. I'm like, yeah, but that's like, I like that. Like that's yeah. sanity for me. Like I enjoy that. Like I'm okay sacrificing that time with my family. Cause then when I go back to my family, I'm a better person. Well, like that is not the story for everyone. Let's be honest. This is easier than doing bedtime right now. Like I'm just going to be like my husband, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to give him some extra kisses later because <laughs> this, this is like a walk in the park compared to trying to get two kids to bed when it's Sunday and it's been a long week and you have school tomorrow. So, um, yeah. it, it really is, uh, it's interesting when people ask me about balance and I'm like, you got to find things outside of your job that bring you joy and make you happy. And that allows you to be a better mom and a better, you know, veterinarian. But it's funny because I do think a lot of the things I love are still very veterinary related. Um, yeah. if that makes sense. So same, but honestly, and that was, this, I had a bigger struggle at the crossroad of having to pull back with the clinic. Like, and that was something that I always dreamed would be the case. And I have no intention of leaving clinics. I absolutely love clinics, but the reality was it was either I had to pull back a little bit at the clinic. I had to give up or do less with the derm vet, or I had to give my kids back. And so obviously yeah. My kids are here to yes. stay. Um, and I <laughs> love the term that. So it really was the finding the balance. And I don't know what the balance is going to be when I go back to traveling for lectures. Like that's a whole nother ball game. And you're okay to fluctuate too. Like if you just need to pull back a little bit, you mentioned Jackie earlier, she pulled back because her son is young, but then when he's in kindergarten, she might be fine to work full time. Yeah. So you're really allowed to decide what's right for you in that moment. And you do not have to be stuck just because you chose something at one point in your life. And maybe now you're transitioning to a different point of being a mom. And I think especially when you spend so much time working for something um, and even you like doing extra, you know, school, uh, an extra test and all that. Like sometimes you feel like, but I went to school for all this and I did all this. And so I need to like use it, you know, but I don't, I don't think that we need to put that pressure on ourselves. Um, any of us, because it doesn't matter that you went to school and did all that. If you're not happy with what you're doing currently and your situation, you have to make a change or else you're going to just burn out and end up not doing it anyways. And you won't like it where you don't even go back to it, you know? Um, oh, so yeah. I think that. For sure. Well, the one thing I know you're trying to allude to earlier, because I don't even have a clock in here, so I'm sure we're short on time, but I don't know what time it is because you're on my phone. We have like five minutes. We're doing oh, good. okay. So we still have time. Yeah. Um, I was like, no one's. So actually, I will still have to do bedtime because I'm on Pacific time. So we're just about to seven. Oh, sorry. Well, I, I know. <laughs> you can a little later next time. No, it's good. Um, so I'll still have to do bedtime. But, um, but I, he's getting witching hours, so it's still a good trade-off. That's bad. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, what you're alluding to before, which I'm really excited about, um, is I don't know when this seems to be the story of my life. I always have these things like in motion, but then I just want don't want to commit to a time because I I really don't know when because we have to order samples and all that stuff. But I'm working with an amazing group of women. And I think that's another thing to realize too. I did hit a point where I couldn't do all the Durham stuff by myself, like graphics that go up. It's all my content. It's all stuff that like I want to do, but I don't spend three hours on Canva to make a graphic, which it truly would take me that long. Um, People help me with that. So I did get to a point where it was, I had to buck up and if it wanted to grow, I needed people who could do the stuff that I didn't know how to do. So I could focus on the stuff that I was good at, which was actually doing the derm part of it. So they have helped me, but it was really passionate project for me as I wanted to put out some vet mom shirts. And so I, I pulled people like you and Jackie and was just looking for ideas. Um, and so I've seen the most recent designs on Friday. We had a meeting about it. So hopefully I'm going to guess like in the next month, or two, because I want to order samples and make sure they're okay first. And I think shipping takes a long time right now. There should be a couple cool shirts and then even potentially a crew neck sweatshirt, which is like all I live in right now. Um, Yeah. That are vet mom related. So if you're a vet mom or know a vet mom, I think they're going to be super cute. You've seen them. I think they're going to be really fun. And just a way to be proud of everything that we do balance as being a vet mom. Yeah. And I think it's nice to like see some of your people sometimes too, you know, like it's nice to be like, Oh my gosh, we have the same issues. And I have a lot of students who are like, you know, we, that's going to be us eventually. And I think that's one reason why those of us out in practice that have been out this long and we've kind of been through that and we're like in it, I think it's nice to speak to what is coming up for the younger generation. Um, and, and, you know, be able to support them and encourage them that, uh, it will be hard, but it will be, you know, they'll get through it. So, I um I just really appreciate you coming on here and I can't wait until the first conference when we get to hang out in oh. person. It's going to be so fun. Oh it's my gonna god. It's going to be so fun and I like totally cuz I fi- I officially hit the year mark since I've been on a plane. I think this past weekend because it was Western Veterinary Conference a year ago. All my memories were popping up. I was like, I will never take for granted again just being on a plane quietly. That used to be like my sanity. Like if a plane got delayed or whatever, I would say if I was traveling without my kids to lecture, I'd say, oh, that's no big deal. Yeah. It's just me. Like if I don't have, you know, a snotty toddler, I have to like keep from touching everything. It doesn't seem so bad. So like, I will just be so excited the first time I'm on a plane. And, and I think that's, what's amazing about the, you know, Vetstagram community is a lot of us, like this has all happened in the last year or two. And like you and I've actually never met face to face. Like there's I've gotten really close to Adam Chrisman. We have actually never met face to face. Like it's crazy. So yeah, I welcome the hugs and I welcome the travel whenever it is safe. Well, and I think both of us are very open to connecting with people. So definitely anyone on here who wants to reach out or if you have more questions, uh, Jay Inan Morency says she's actually um, a Durham intern in a private practice in Montreal. Oh. And so she enjoyed this. So um, definitely reach out to Ashley if you have questions just about career and options. Um, we both, even though we are very busy, I think the thing I enjoy most is just having a message that's really personal that someone wants to talk about something or need something that makes all that worth it for sure. So, um, I appreciate you. I will let you go do bedtime now and I'm going to go see uh-huh. in bed. <laughs> and, I know I hear some pounding upstairs, so know, I'm sure like, it's fine. Uh, it's, but I do appreciate his twinning on not on purpose. So I, I know my sister was on here and she's like, did you guys plan your outfits? I'm like, no, sister, uh, we, did we don't have time. They no. don't know. Us. But I do think you need to do this color in a crew neck because this is my favorite color. So I'm going to need okay. you to do that. <laughs> All I'll, right. I'll work on it. Thank y'all for joining us. Uh, yeah. I'll save this on Instagram TV series. Uh, and then if you have any other questions, reach out. And I hope everyone has a good week next week. Mine will be better than it was last week in Texas. That's for sure. So <laughs> we'll talk to y'all later. Bye, Ashley. Bye, guys. Thank you.